Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'll start by thanking the organizer for inviting me to this uh, stimulating uh, meeting in a very interesting place. Uh, the title of my talk is Chaotic Properties of Skin Lattices at High Temperatures. And so, specifically, what kind of chaotic properties going to talk about? I will be talking about Laponoff exponents and out of time order correlators and some other properties. So, uh, like Tomas, I was actually always interested in the properties of non integrable systems of spins one half, which are as far from the classical limit as system can be. And went back and forth comparing uh, classical and quantum properties, and I was permanently bugged by the questions from the audience. So what about Laponoff exponents? Do our classical uh, spin systems really chaotic and so forth? And so at, at, at some point I became annoyed enough and we basically learned the techniques of um, computing Laponoff exponents in many body spin systems and discovered quite a few interesting things. And this, by the way, led us to start using the notion of out of time or the correlators. Actually, before this term appeared uh, and before the subject uh, exploded in the high energy physics community. So uh, uh, I will explain what led us to these uh, ideas. So let me start uh, at a very basic level. Uh, I let's define Laponoff exponent for a lattice of classical spins. So this S are uh, uh, classical spin vectors normalized to one uh, nearest neighbor coupling, some kind of lattice. And so the way you simulate this lattice classically is that that you, you just obtain equations of motion. So for each spin, it is a sort of Larmor precession in a local field which is created by the neighbors and also changes the function of time. To calculate Laponoff exponents, you need to look at small deviations for, for uh, uh, at, at the evolution of small deviations of initial conditions. So you introduce small perturbation to these equations, right? And, and then this is what you can also compute as function of time. And you follow the evolution of this, uh, small differences of in coordinates, right? Uh, we are speaking about many body problem, and so we need to define many body phase space. So in this case, it is uh, convenient to define it like this. It's just simply a set of all projections of each spin combined in a very large vector. And likewise, there is a vector of small deviations, right? At the evolution of which we are looking. And then out of that, we want to get a uh, Laponoff exponents. So how does it work? Uh, in general, the system has many Laponoff exponents, positive and negative, coming in pairs. Uh, but if you start with an arbitrary perturbation, then it, is, it generally contains a projection on the direction of the largest Laponoff exponent of the system. And so if you let this pair of trajectories evolve for sufficiently long time, then eventually the difference between them uh, is determined by the largest Laponoff exponent. And with some technical tricks, this is how it is computed. So, so the, the, the largest Laponoff exponent is the, this limit of the uh, uh, exponential, uh, uh, of the rate of the exponential growth of this difference. Now, with this Laponoff exponent, when you do the calculation, you can also obtain the Laponoff vector, and then you can repeat the procedure in the orthogonal subspace to that Laponoff vector, and that gives you the second Laponoff exponent, the third Laponoff exponent, and eventually you can get the whole Laponoff spectrum. So, uh, once we learned to, uh, this, 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 this technique, we uh, decided, you know, to uh, uh, train our hand and simultaneously ask sort of interesting questions. questions. And one question that uh, concerns many people is basically, what if there is some hidden integrability? That if 
there is some combination of say coupling parameters such that the lattice suddenly becomes integrable, but that would mean that the largest Lyapunov exponent of such a lattice would be equal to zero. And so what we decided to do, we made a random survey of Lyapunov exponents for seven different lattices pictured here. And for each lattice, we uh, randomly sample points on the so-called interaction sphere uh, shown here. And this plot is basically the collection of all our results. So uh, different colors here represent different lattices and each point here represents one largest Lyapunov exponent computing for a particular choice of the uh, coupling constants. And on the horizontal axis, you have the largest of the three coupling constants. So what did we learn from this simulation? So first of all, we found that there are really no in interesting integrable cases besides the trivial case of, uh, of Ising interaction. So when one of these constants is one and the rest is zero. So, so that means that it corresponds to this point one here. And you see here that, that, that all Lyapunov exponents really go to zero. There is nothing else. Second, uh, we also see that the largest Lyapunov exponent, the value of the largest Lyapunov exponent is mostly controlled by the largest of these three constants in general. And, um, and then what we also found that actually the dependence of this Lyapunov exponents for bipartite lattices like cubic square lattice chain is largely universal. So they can be superposed on the top of each other. And moreover, uh, when, when the maximum of this constant is like 0.85, it becomes nearly flat. So, so you, you, uh, you, you basically can uh, guess the value of Lyapunov exponent of any sort of generic uh, We went, uh, we, we also, by the way, discovered, and I can discuss more with those of you who are interested, that here in the vicinity of the integrable limit, there is an interesting power law scaling of the value of the largest Lyapunov exponent on the deviation from Grebelian. That's, that's, I will, I will. So that was important. That was a really important question which we also wanted to understand, but the answer is yes. Uh, so we went beyond, beyond the, the uh, uh, largest Lyapunov exponent and also computed all the, the entire Lyapunov spectra and so, so this spectra for uh, several lattices are presented in this plot. So this is the index of the Lyapunov exponent divided by the number of the Lyapunov exponents, and that's the value. So this spectra look reasonably boring, right? So, so you, the, 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 these Lyapunov exponents, they are nearly equally spaced, and they sort of nearly uniformly go between uh, maximum value and zero. Uh, uh, now the okay so so and then there, there was this this question of uh, how does this whole story depend on the size of this lattice? So before we went into this business, I, I I I sort of asked around, you know, people who do simulations, you know, what do they expect? And the people were sort of uncomfortable, you know, those with background in simulating classical guesses. Maybe it grows logarithmically with system size. So what we discovered that it, the largest Lyapunov exponent of the classical spin lattices is an intensive quantity. It does not grow with the system size. So, so you, see, you see it, we saw, saw it numerically, and then we figured out that there is a simple analytical argument for that. And the argument is as follows. Uh, of course, this Lyapunov process occurs in many dimensional phase space. And so, so something happens there, and this trajectory is sort of separate from each other, but this story in the many dimensional phase space is projected onto the subspace of every spin. And so it means that for two perturb trajectories, uh, the projections of spins should separate basically on average with the same rate, but the uh, rate of separation for individual spins is basically limited by the maximum value of the local fields that we see. 
right? So, so they, see, they have finite number of neighbors, and so there is absolute uh, limit from above uh, such that, that the Lyapunov exponent just simply cannot be larger than that. And so this limit may be a bit larger than what we obtained, but at least we know that this limit exists and maybe somehow slowly these things approach this limit, but most likely what we found is really the uh, uh, value which one would get in the thermodynamic limit. Now, uh, the same uh, applies also to the whole Lyapunov spectra. So, so, so this is the spectrum for the Heisenberg chain. Uh, of different lengths, and you see that that the, the the shape of the spectrum quickly converges to the basically what we expect in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, what is a useful lesson also from that when it eventually uh, uh, comes to say out of time order correlators, it's that you know uh, those things when 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 one actually tries to extract Lyapunov exponents. What one extracts is not really the value of just the largest Lyapunov exponent. What happens here that there is the edge, the edge of this Lyapunov spectrum, and so the longer you simulate, the closer you approach this edge, and so at the end of the day, you see something which is which is very close to the largest Lyapunov exponent, but the spectrum of the Lyapunov exponents is supposed to be nearly continuous. Uh, now, uh, Sort of, uh, of course, uh, what we were interested in, not just in doing simulations, but really sort of uh, in providing some insight into how one can make uh, uh, experimental determination of the value of the Lyapunov exponent in the many body system. And this is challenging, right? So there are, there are several sort of fundamental difficulties. One difficulty is that we, cannot experimentally, of course, observe phase space coordinates of every particle, even if they were classical. We also cannot controllably prepare too close initial conditions in many body phase space and slightly perturb them. Required accuracy. But on the top of it, there is another difficulty, and that is that the statistical behavior of many particle systems masks the Lyapunov instabilities. You don't read about Lyapunov instabilities in textbooks like Landau Lifshitz. Uh, so what, what happens? Well, let me illustrate this last point uh, by a sketch of a kind of relaxation in a many body phase space. So suppose this is a piece of an energy shell and I'm monitoring some observable which can be total magnetization of the system. And uh, in the course of uh, relaxation, this observable decays to uh, the zero value, which the consequence second law of thermodynamics, basically, right? And so this is one path in many dimensional space how this happens. Now, if I slightly perturb the initial conditions, then basically the perturb trajectory uh, uh, strongly deviates from the initial one, obviously. But it has the same statistical properties and in many body systems, so when you look at the total magnetization, the, the uh, the result is basically nearly the same, so you just don't see any effect of that. Makes all the story difficult. What is the way out? It turns out that there is a quite sort of ingenious way to deal with this, and that is to observe that this is the behavior of the typical trajectories, and therefore in order to extract the Lyapunov properties, uh, one needs to look at the behavior of atypical trajectories. And how does one get atypical trajectories? Uh, one way of doing this is just by time reversal of the relaxation, which is also known as Loschmidt echo. Now, if, if this happens, so if this is my direct trajectory, and, and then I get this is my reverse trajectory, which follows highly atypical path, and suppose I implement it experimentally. Obviously, again, here, experimental errors uh, come uh, uh, to help, actually, because you always have them, and so a slightly perturbed trajectory will initially follow this atypical behavior, but then, because of Lyapunov instabilities, it would deviate from that behavior, and eventually it will turn to a typical behavior, whereas the ideally reverse trajectory would continue 
uh, with its atypical behavior. And so here you would statistically expect that, uh, that, uh, that there is a Lyapunov regime that, that the uh, Lyapunov exponents would influence the statistical behavior in the vicinity of this point. Right? And that's what we wanted to actually explore, implement in classical spin systems. But now you can ask how, how this time reversal is possible, right? Of course, you cannot reverse individual momenta of particles or individual spins. Sounds not doable. But it turns out that people in nuclear magnetic resonance has found a way already more than 40 years ago. Uh, and so let me, in order to speak about that, let me just say a few words about this context, nuclear magnetic resonance. Right? So, so this is a classical picture of nuclear spin like a ball with some magnetic moment. This is a nuclear spin one half. All are controlled by, uh, in external magnetic field, the primary motion is the Lamar precession, and then comes the interaction. So what uh, people in NMR often measure is called free induction decay. So the setting of this free induction decay, you can, from a theoretical perspective, looks like that. You have a lattice of slightly polarized nuclear spin, spins, and then this polarization decays because of the interaction between nuclear spins, which does not conserve it in this direction, and then it just goes to zero. And this process, is, by the way, is called T2, solid state in MR. So, which is controlled by the Hamiltonian of magnetic dipole interaction in the rotating reference frame, averaged over the fast Larma precession. So uh, the coupling constants K is one over R cube. Uh, uh, typically, the strength of these couplings is much smaller than the temperature, so we are in the infinite temperature limit. And uh, according to the linear response uh, fluctuation dissipation relations, the, the, this non equilibrium free induction decay is proportional to the infinite temperature uh, correlation function of the total magnetization of the system. And this is how one would define the correlation function. This is uh, the standard NMR formulation of the story. Classically, you would, you would calculate this average by averaging over all possible uh, uh, trajectories of classical spins like the one shown in this figure. Um, so uh, this work that I mentioned that, you know, that how, how people learn to do it, it was done by Rim, Pines, and Wo in, in 70. So it says violation of the spin temperature hypothesis. And the first line here says a Loschmidt demon is exhibited, which effectively reverses the spin-spin relaxation. That was 1970. And so what they published here was actually a photograph of oscilloscope. And here you see this free induction decay. Here they have done something. Then the free induction decay after fairly long time comes entirely back. And this is not Han echo, which is sort of a trivial thing, compensating uh, for inhomogeneous external field. So here, they, uh, what they do, they, they, they figured out that they can reverse the sign of the Hamiltonian of the effective interaction between nuclear spins. So what I presented was the Hamiltonian in the static magnetic field. You can turn on a radio frequency magnetic field sufficiently strong. And, and then averaging over this combination of static and radio frequency magnetic field gives you the same Hamiltonian, but with the opposite sign. So, so, so this story was not widely known in the statistical physics community until uh, uh, the, this uh, paper of Horacio Postavsky, Patricia Levstein, and collaborators, uh, where they sort of used the same technique uh, modification of this technique, they call polarization echo. And what they try to do, they try to improve the reversibility of the spin dynamics. They were dealing here again with experimental system of spins one half, microscopic system. And so what they saw is that, that the parameter they controlled was this value of the radio frequency field, which controlled the quality of time reversal. They, for smaller fields, they obtained a result like that. Then they were improving this quality of time reversal, so the, the uh, recovery time sort of slightly improved, but then it stopped, right? 
And then they came, they came with a swift conclusion that this is all due to chaos, right? And this is the Neymar answer to the boltzmann loschmidt controversy, right? Uh, after that, there was another influential paper when, when uh, Postavsky and Jalabert basically looked at quantum fidelity of one particle system and indeed saw that, that if one does loschmidt echo time reversal, then for the fidelity, there is a regime controlled by the Lyapunov exponent of the system, but this is not one particle system. This is a system of pins one half. If one looks for a fidelity for a many body system, which is, I mean, I would say totally irrelevant. So, so it decays on times on the time scale, which is exponentially faster than that. Uh, so uh, it it remained unclear what uh, chaos has to do with that story, and that's what we wanted to address. Right, and so and we hoped also in, in along the way to define basically the notion of a Lyapunov exponent for in one half lattice. Right? So so we started our treatment with uh, the uh, consideration of time reversal of equilibrium magnetization. Okay, so this was done in collaboration with uh, these people. Uh, so our consideration was the following. Let, let, let's think of, of an equilibrium noise of a classical spin, total spin. Okay, so suppose that time initially runs from right to left and you follow the green line, so this is some kind of noise. Then at this point, you reverse the Hamiltonian of your system and simultaneously you slightly perturb the, uh, each spin by tiny angle. And then you follow the magnetization. So, so initially it traces back the noise, so it's a blue line, but then you see that it separates. Uh, and then you look at the difference, right? So, so did, we did this on purpose because, because we had in mind the following picture. The picture was again like that, that you have some kind of Lyapunov process. Uh, uh, you have some kind of Lyapunov process in many dimensional space. Right? What is, in general, rather poorly known about this process is how Lyapunov vectors behave. But we made an assumption that these Lyapunov vectors sort of sufficiently randomly rotate in space, and uh, on the one hand, the projection on them sort of grows exponentially with time, on average. On the other hand, uh, it can also, when you project this, uh, this Lyapunov vector on a particular axis of a particular spin or on the axis of the total magnetization, the sign can change, but overall the envelope of this uh, thing is supposed to grow basically with the largest Lyapunov exponent, and that's what we were checking here, right? And this dashed line is the one corresponding to the largest Lyapunov exponent, which we computed directly, and moreover here, if you check, if you, if you average over the initial conditions for this noise, then these points where these things go through zero sort of average out, and you get this plot in the inset. So you see that the average of the difference between two noises over the ensemble basically starts following the largest Lyapunov exponent. So if, if this expression is correct, that the, the, the absolute value of the difference grows as the largest Lyapunov exponent, then we can take the square of that and expect that the square grows as now with the constant which is twice the largest Lyapunov exponent. But now if you look at the square, if you, uh, if you expand the square, right, there will be mean squared value, equilibrium mean squared value of the magnetization plus the correlation function between the initial and the magnetization before and after the, 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 the reversal, right? And so, so from that, from this relation, you, you, you therefore get an expression for the equilibrium correlation function before and after reversal, which has a regime uh, which should be controllable by twice the largest Lyapunov exponent. But now you recall that, that, you, that you, 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 should, you, you can use the uh, Anzaghi regression relation or fluctuation dissipation. Uh, whatever you call it, and then there, there must be non-equilibrium process which corresponds to this equilibrium correlation function, and this non-equilibrium process 
is basically what what uh, uh, pines and collaborators were doing when they measured this magic echo in NMR. So, and that's what we also implemented numerically. So, this was the Hamiltonian power interaction. We started with the initial state, which which had this probability distribution, which was slightly polarized along the x direction. Uh, and then we, we, we computed the average magnetization uh, with the following uh, time evolution. So during time tau, the, the evolution was with this Hamiltonian. And then after time tau, we implemented tiny rotations of spin vectors. And then the evolution with the uh, reverse Hamiltonian. Right? So, so this is a formal expression for that. And so we, we were interested in the quantity, which is the ratio of this peak over the peak the beginning. So, so this is something that is expressible by the correlation function from the previous slide. So, and we expected a Lyapunov regime. So we did it for cubic lattice of 16 by 16 by 16 spins. And this is what we found. So, so this is one minus this function on the vertical axis. Look, uh, this is time. And the, the dashed line again is the one which is twice the largest Lyapunov exponent. And you see that, that it worked. We also implemented a different version of a perturbation to the perfect time reversal, namely uh, evolution with uh, a slightly different Hamiltonians. So what happens in this case, that initially the difference between the Hamiltonians seeds the difference between two trajectories. But then after a while, this difference no longer matters because it just becomes different initial conditions for each of the two Hamiltonians. And then this difference grows uh, uh, the same as here. So, so, so there is the same Lyapunov regime, but just delayed in time. So this was the classical story. And we thought, oh, OK, I mean, great. We now do exactly the same for the quantum system. Right? So, so that's these small rotations, evolutions, right? That's what you can implement directly, yes? Yes, right, precisely. Sir? With standard method. With standard method. With standard method. So always these dashed lines are computed with the standard method. Uh, so, um, so we thought, OK, we, we uh, now define the quantum Lyapunov exponents. However, we were disappointed. And so, so that was actually the title of our paper which was absence of exponential sensitivity to small perturbations for non-integrable systems of spins one half. And we understood why we had it. Right? So let me, let me explain what we did. Right? So, so this is now quantum spin lattice. So these are quantum spin operators. Uh, the quantity that we computed now uh, quantum mechanically looks like this. This is initial density matrix. Uh, this is the direct evolution. This is. Um, small rotation of each spin implemented with this rotation operators and reverse, and that's the quantity of it. Um, so we did not get the Lyapunov region. And we now understand why we didn't. And in that paper, we also reported it. Right? We did not get it because uh, what we also understand, understand now about the classical systems is that the Lyapunov process, the one which creates Lyapunov instability, which is not something that one spin perturbs different spin and that spin perturbs yet another spin. It doesn't go like that. It goes like this. So perturbation of this spin perturbs that spin, and then it comes back to this spin, amplifies this, and then comes back. So it is a local process which goes back and forth locally between spins. And so it is essential for that process that the spins are classical and can have small perturbations. Now, if you think of this story for spins one half, then it looks actually different. So you have spin one half, you slightly perturb it by a rotation. And so what you get as a result is mostly the original state, which is completely unperturbed, and a state which is strongly perturbed when the spin basically flips the sign completely. We can also do the same with classical spins, just simply completely flipping them, and we would get the same result, not the Lyapunov regime. 
right? So, and this is how it works. So let me skip maybe this technicality. So, so, so this all can be reduced by, you know, by press by considering many body wave functions and then present you uh, a cartoon uh, of sort of, of the idea that you have. So uh, the, this manipulation in terms of uh, underlying system looks as follows. So you have a lattice of spins and then each wave function which contributes sort of to the eventual sort of many body evolution in the superposition looks like that. You uh, basically randomly perturb a dilute fraction of spins but each spin is perturbed strongly, right? And so when this happens, there is no room for the perturbation to grow and therefore the only way it can grow, it can go by sort of transferring perturbation to the neighbors, then to the neighbors of neighbors and so forth. That's a fast process, but this process is not exponential. It, there is a limit on the velocity of that, uh, 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 also known as uh, Lee Robinson uh, limit. So, so this uh, process of perturbation does not grow exponentially. It grows as a power law dependent on the dimension of the system, the character of interaction and so forth. And so if it starts with uh, several spins simultaneously still, initially it is a power law, and then it saturates and you're out of the Lyapunov regime. So you never, you are never supposed to see the Lyapunov behavior. And this is what we also, uh, that's what we also obtain numerically. So, so this is a five by five lattice, non-integrable spins one half, nice uh, Wigner Dyson statistics. And so this quantity of interest, it looks sort of similar to what we saw before, but this is a short range and no exponential growth regime. So this was our result. And, and this result is, is important in the sense that, uh, say at least my personal hope to recover classical chaotic limit sort of uh, did not get realized despite the fact that we are dealing with the correlation function of the total magnetization of a macroscopic lattice. So, so something which is about which in principle you can think of as classical. And so the lesson that we draw from that is that uh, supposedly uh, non-integrable quantum systems do not share, generically do not share with chaotic systems the property of exponential sensitivity to small perturbation. However, they probably, presumably, share the property of ergodicity. So ergodicity is where these systems overlap, and that's a bit non-intuitive because if you think of a classical system with any kind of sort of reasonable interaction, which is generically, I would say, both uh, chaotic and ergodic, right? So chaotic in the sense of Lyapunov instead. Uh, now, on a different level, however, what we did here uh, was, so, so this quantity was, was out of time order correlator. So what later became popularized as out of time order correlator. So it's correlation, so it's something at time zero, then this guy is at time tau, then this guy at time zero, and this is also at time. So the out of time order correlators as widely being used today, they are just second derivatives of that. Uh, uh, but what we also kind of uh, realized at that time, we were not particularly interested in this subject, but we realized that as the spin increases, then according to our argument, uh, that, uh, you know, say if you have spin with 10 energy levels, right, or 10, 10, 10 values of spin projection, then at least there is a factor of 10 for the Lyapunov uh, growth to exist and uh, Later, we published a, sh a short paper on that, basically implementing the same story, but for, in particular, for spins uh, 15 halves, so seven and a half. So here, the blue line is the classical spins, then the black line is the spins uh, seven and a half, and dashed line, say, for comparison, is the, this for spins one half, and this is the uh, Lyapunov behavior. So basically, so what you see here that there is here at least a decade when this uh, quantum uh, uh, quantum spin chain followed the Lyapunov growth, and that was, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, first demonstration of the Lyapunov regime for an out-of-time order quantum correlator in a many-body system. 
and also with specific relation to twice the largest Lyapunov exponent. Uh, I should mention though that, that the original, this concept of out of time order correlation appeared in the 60s in the paper of Larkin and of Chinnikov for one particle scattering in, in superconductors uh, without any explicit statement on the Lyapunov exponents and so on. Um, here you can also observe, if you look closely, that actually the slope of this classical line and the quantum line seem to be slightly different from this twice the largest Lyapunov exponent. And we were sort of uncomfortable with that, published things as, as they were, and uh, eventually another PhD student of mine, uh, Andrei Tarkov, uh, looked close, closer into this issue, and we discovered that actually there is a systematic correction to this twice the largest Lyapunov exponent, uh, which uh, simultaneously can be uh, used as a measure of the organization time um, in the system. So let me, uh, let me explain what, what I'm talking about. So first of all, organization time is a concept which is intrinsically poorly defined, right? Uh, you don't look um, you don't look uh, at the energy shell, you look at a particular observable, but here we are speaking about uh, an observable which is, I would say, very intrinsic for chaotic system, which is Lyapunov exponent itself, right? So uh, the origin of this deviation was in the fluctuating character of the Lyapunov exponents. And uh, so uh, this fluctuation, they actually make systematic correction to the out of time order correlators. You can define correlation function of these fluctuations and define the typical size of this correlation function uh, expressed in, form, in the form of this integral as the organization time. And um, this is the out of the quantity computed in the out of time order correlator. So it is average of an exponent, whereas in general, what, what we care is exponent of the average, or in other words, so, so, so this is, uh, yes, and so, so this, this is a st uh, standard sort of difference, and there are standard methods to, com to compute it, and so that's what we did, and we obtained that the difference between the growth rate of the out of time order correlator and the Lyapunov exponent is actually controlled by the integral, which you see here, and you know, when you look at this and you look at this, you get this expression for the organization time. So the difference between the Lyapunov growth and the growth of the out of time order correlator also contains this uh, information. That was, I mean, in, in general, this kind of, that the existence of this kind of systematic correction was first uh, discussed uh, in the paper of the group of Galitsky. And then, but then also as the relevance to quantum systems, uh, Serbin and Tabanin uh, later considered uh, basically similar measures. So they, they compared quantum mechanical out of the growth of quantum mechanical out of time order correlator with something that looks similar to this average uh, in, the, in the effort to discriminate uh, many body uh, uh, localization from uh, thermalized phase. So, so we we did that, we checked, and so what we discovered uh, was basically that it works for two-dimensional and, and three-dimensional lattices, but for one-dimensional lattices, even though which they generally uh, thermalize, in fact, in fact, uh, there is a pretty long organization time which, which even falls outside of uh, this method. So with this, let me, let me skip to my conclusions. Um, uh, there was this subject which I wanted to discuss. Let me just. Conclusion. So basically, uh, this is the summary of I presented, but this part which I skipped, and this part is basically there is also a proposal which I made a long time ago that actually, as an alternative to exponential sensitivity to uh, uh, small deviations from the initial conditions one can look at fast exponential long time tails of non-constructed quantities like free induction decay in NMR and 
they have a universal exponential behavior, which is actually a manifestation of quantum chaos in both classical and quantum systems, and I will be happy to discuss with both of you. If I, if I recall correctly, I mean, you know, quite some time ago, people looked at uh, the up of exponents for a system of hard spheres, for instance, and then uh, used uh, some type of theory to, to predict what the value is. And, you know, I mean, so, so there was a time when there was sort of quite considerable study. I mean, is there any connection between your work and, 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 and what they have been doing? Uh, well, uh, yes, I mean, we are aware of this works. Uh, I mean, this. Uh, 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 Classical spin systems, they are, in a sense, stronger interacting systems than, than, than hard spheres. Uh, one of uh, my collaborators, Astrid Devine, she also did work on, on those systems. But no, I mean, the short answer, we, at least we are not aware of any immediate connection between the two values of Lyapunov. No question. So when would the Lakshmite echo in the, numerically in the classical? I mean, the numerical inaccuracies, is that a big worry? I mean, is that a strong limitation on the time? Well, I mean, uh, you just should do enough statistical averaging. And so in that case, uh, accuracy was in general smaller than the. So, so, so you, you want to get average relaxation, you just yeah. you have an ensemble of initial conditions, you just repeat it sufficiently many times. The accurate average. 